Good morning again. So this morning I have the honor of introducing our banker in our group, Dan Martin, Vice President and Branch Manager of the One West Bank. Five dollars. Today's speech is number five. Good morning, Mr. When I saw the title, I thought, well, maybe that should be the title of my speech. Insuring our children? He's a banker. I'm the insurance guy. But anyway, his speech objective today is to his stance, his movements, gestures. Can I have some good gestures? Great. Facial expression and eye contact. So that's what you want to be looking for to see if he's following the procedure here to give us a good speech on that, and I'm very anxious to hear Dan speak. Good morning. Good morning. So do all of us have children here? I would say everybody has children. No? Dogs. Yes? Dogs. Dogs. Well, of Too course many. we insure our children, right? To make sure that their health and medical benefits are taken care of, and then that's pretty much what we work for, right? For our families and to, to move forward and to be successful. Well, I have a son, and my son is going to be 11 on August 6th of this year. This is my son. <laughs> 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 go to the vet last month and I had a very expensive vet bill and it really made me start thinking about uh, pet insurance about my life growing up because as I've shared before I grew up on a farm and living on a farm when an animal, animal was sick when I was growing up you put it down it, it wasn't something that you spent thousands of dollars on to, to get this animal better for example I had my very first cat as a child um, was my heifer we tried to breed her two years in a row, she wouldn't take. So what do you do? It's, it's somebody that said, it's a cow that's not producing, so we had to put her down. She became next winter's food, right? So all these stories start coming to the And I know it sounds awful, but it's, it's, it's you know, you're thinking this. Well, and there's another fun story when I was younger. I, my, my next cow, she was having a calf, and I never got to see a calf be born. So I, I would always, I was very excited to see, you know, one finally be born. And it always happened at night. So I came home late one night. It was, must have been 11, 12 o'clock. Nobody was home. My sister was still out. My parents weren't home. But I grabbed my flashlight, and I ran out to the barn. And sure enough, she was, she was having her calf. And I watched her, she'd lay down, and she'd push and push, and she'd stand up and go in a circle, and she'd lay down and push and push, and suddenly when something started coming out, it was two hooves. And I panicked, oh my God, the cow's coming out of reach. So I ran into the house, and I started making phone calls, trying to find out where you know, my parents were and what to do, because the, the cow's coming out of reach, right? Because it's coming out of hooves first. You would think it would be head first. So I couldn't get a hold of anybody. Last chance, I called my dad's partner, we own our own business, and told him, oh my gosh, Rick, Rick, my, my, my heifer's having her calf, and the calf's coming out of reach. And he says, what? Coming out of reach? Think about it, Dan. What is the first thing to come out? Well, the head. No, put your arms over your head. Now, what's the first thing to come out? The head. No, the hooves. <laughs> so, funny story. You know, I probably just phone call. So, the cow came out fine, and everything, and everything went great. But when I was at the vet, I actually had to go to the vet, took my dog to the vet, because I knew something was wrong with him. And the doctor took some x-rays, thinking there was something wrong with his back, and they actually found a mass, a large mass in his chest. So they called me and told me to come pick him up. I had to go directly to the veterinary, emergency veterinary clinic. <clears throat> well, when I left the vet to go to the veterinary clinic, that bill alone right there was $900. So I paid that bill, scooped him up, and I headed to the vet hospital. By the time I got there, I walked in and I said, this is, this is Hideo, and I was told to come here as soon as possible. And I said, your vet already called, scooped him up. They think that he has a tumor on his spleen that is ruptured and he's bleeding out. <clears throat> so, excuse me. So they take him in and shave his belly, and they do an ultrasound, and they come out, and they basically said, your doctor's right. It looks like he has a large tumor on his spleen, and it needs to come out, and it needs to come out right away. Um, and here's, here's what you can expect. The dog can live a, f a full life without a spleen. He doesn't need a spleen. It acts as a filter for the blood, but 
he could be more susceptible to disease or, or um, illnesses, but for the most part, he's a house dog, so you don't have to worry about, about those types of things. If you don't do anything, obviously he's just gonna bleed out and die. Now, the risk is that 70% of the time, these tumors are cancerous. 30%, they're not cancerous, and the dog will live a full life. So then he leaves me in the room to think about whether or not I wanna proceed with the surgery or just let nature take its course. But before he does that, <laughs> He says, now, after we go through the whole emotional experience of it, and he's sitting here next to me, and I'm like, okay, let's do the surgery. And then he says, you're looking at about a $6,000 surgery. Yeah. Mm, mm. And then he says, I'll leave you alone. <laughs> think about this but I've already pretty much made the decision to do it, right? And how can you say no when the little guy's sitting next to you, staring yeah. at you, and he looks fine, like, get me out of here, because I know what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> So needless to say, I went ahead and did the surgery. And it came back negative, no cancer. Yeah. So he's at home and he's doing wonderful. He's split open front end to end, mm. had tons of staples, was in a cone and the whole nine yards. But it's this, the, whole, the whole story just started making me think about whether or not I should get pet insurance. So I started doing some <laughs> research. <laughs> <laughs> the very first pet insurance policy was written in 1924 in, in Sweden. <laughs> In 1982, the very first pet insurance premium was written in the United States for a famous TV dog. Would somebody like to guess? Lassie. <laughs> <laughs> now, some other um, in interesting information. In Sweden today, over 50% of pet owners insure their pets. Huh. The second country, largest country, is Great Britain with over 25% of people insuring their pets. In the U.S., of almost 75 million dogs that are in, in the United States, less than 3% have pet insurance. So I think somebody's got something there. And then some other interesting facts is that in the US, in 2010, we spent $48 billion on, on our pets. And of that, $13 billion was in veterinary bills. And in 2011, we're expected to spend over $14 billion on our pets. So when you think about the fact that an average pet insurance premium policy is about $35 a month, which is around $42, $420 a year, the average person spends over $655 um, a year on their pets. So I would say to take it into that into consideration and how much your, your pet means to you, because over 70% of people polled says that they consider their pet part of their family. And over 50% of the people polled said that if they were to be stranded on a deserted island, they would rather be with their dog. <laughs> so with that being said, I would say take a look at those top pet insurance companies, which is VPI and Heartbill Group and Pet Healthcare Inc., and consider whether or not you may think that that family member is worth paying the $35 a month mm. for pet insurance to protect him should you get stranded on a deserted island. Thank you. Mm. Oh, these are just vet bills. I